The story continues with Makoto on his way to the city of Rostgard, and we see that right now he is in the city of Obit. He thinks that walking is exhausting, and Shiki mentions that it is, but it's better than being caught by the goddess while they teleport. Makoto mentions that she might toss them into battle again, and he thinks that everything is the fault of the goddess. Shiki mentions that they are almost at Rostgard, and he states that he will find them an inn, and he asks Makoto to get something to eat in the meantime. Makoto mentions that he is fine with any inn, and Shiki states that he can't allow that. He mentions that Tomoe and Mio are going to be mad at him if he gets Makoto a cheap inn, and Makoto wonders if putting the two of them in charge of the demiplane was really a good idea. The scene then cuts to the demiplane, and Tomoe finds out that Mio has become interested in cooking, and she wants to make something that Makoto likes. She mentions that she can understand this, but she wonders how a simple taste testing went so wrong. Mio states that she doesn't know, and Tomoe thinks that she was right to have the young master's food tested for poison. Mio wonders if Tomoe is calling her food poison, and she mentions that she only made curry rice based on the young master's memories. Tomoe asks her if she has ever eaten curry rice before, and Mio states that she hasn't as it's food from another world. Tomoe wonders if she asked Makoto for the recipe, and Mio states that she didn't as she wanted to give him a surprise. Emma then asks Mio if this green object in the curry is an ore, and Mio states that it is. She mentions that she thought that this would taste heavenly, and Burin finds out that Mio put soft emerald in the curry. Komoe then mentions that the curry also had the pot's handle in it, and Mio notices that the pot has melted. She then tastes the curry herself, and she thinks that it's not bad enough to knock someone out. Tomoe then tells Mio that many species in the demiplane, and the young master himself, don't eat mineral ores. They also don't eat weapons or buildings, and Mio is shocked to hear that those things aren't food. Tomoe wonders if Mio has ever studied the art of cooking, and Mio states that she at least knows how to use fire. Tomoe then asks Mio to make a piece of slightly burned toast, but Mio burns the bread completely, and Tomoe states that Mio has a lot to learn when it comes to cooking. The scene then cuts to Makoto eating some kind of blue meat, and the owner of the restaurant he is eating it asks him to not make such a repulsive face while he is eating, as his face is bad enough as it is. Makoto apologizes for this, and he mentions that this dish is delicious, and the owner is surprised to see that Makoto writes with magic. Makoto explains to him that he can't speak the common tongue due to various reasons, and he wonders if the main ingredient of this dish is slime. The owner thinks that Makoto is well informed, and Makoto thinks that slimes taste great. The owner mentions that Makoto seems like an accomplished adventurer, and he states that he has posted a slime hunt quest in the guild, and he would be glad if Makoto could take it. Makoto states that he is registered at the Adventurer's Guild, but he is mainly a merchant, and he is traveling to Rostgard. Hearing this some people at the restaurant look at Makoto with a creepy smile, and Makoto leaves the restaurant after paying with a gold coin, and he also doesn't take his change. He thinks that he is out of change, and he wonders if this makes him a bad merchant. Makoto then walks around town, and everyone who looks at him is surprised to see how ugly he is. He then goes to the guild, and he looks around for some quests, and he notices that the slime capturing quest is a B-rank job. He thinks that he can't take it as he is still A-rank, and a girl then comes into the guild, and she mentions that Moon over the ruined castle is going to attack their town soon. Makoto overhears this, and he thinks that this is the name of a song, and he wonders what the girl means. He then finds out that this is the name of a bandit group here and the girl wonders why no one is willing to take the quest to fight these bandits even though she is willing to pay for it. The receptionist states that they are talking about a group of ferocious bandits, and there are more than a hundred of them. Right now, they lack the combat strength to take them on, and she should come back next month as they are going to have enough fighters then. The girl can't believe this, and she wonders if they have been abandoned by the goddess. Some guys then tell the girl that they can give her a discount, and they try to get handsy with her but the girl runs out of the guild crying, and Makoto notices this. Afterwards we see Makoto in an alley, and he thinks that paying with a gold coin was a bad idea. He uses his kai to notice that three people have followed him from the restaurant, and some people from the guild are troubling the girl he just saw. Makoto defeats the guys from the restaurant, and he throws them at the adventurers from earlier to save the girl. Makoto then defeats the remaining adventurers, and the girl wonders if he is helping them because he is a demi-human like his friend here. Makoto states that he is human, and he uses his kai to heal the injury of the girl's demi-human friend. 
Makoto then introduces himself, and he mentions that he is an adventurer, but he is mainly a merchant. The girl then thanks him for saving them, and she introduces herself as Rana from Tapa Village, and she mentions that her friend here is named Ido, and he is a werewolf. Makoto thinks that he is different from the werewolves he has imagined, and he offers to carry Ido for her. They then walk towards Rana's village, and Makoto asks the girl about the bandits she mentioned earlier. Rana tells him that the bandits attacked them recently, and they tortured Parley to death to make an example out of him, as he was the strongest of them. The villagers are now giving in, and they are handing over their money and savings. She mentions that every village they have been to, has been slaughtered and robbed clean, and her village is also doomed now. Ito then wakes up, and he asks Rana if the guild is going to send help. Rana tells him that the guild has refused, and Makoto then thinks that he is used to death at this point, and it's more common in this world than his last one. He thought that he had accepted this, but it seems that he hasn't. He then mentions that he will send them back to the village, and he asks Rana where it is. Rana tells him that it's over those mountains, and Makoto jumps over to her village with Rana and Ido, and the two of them are surprised to see this. The scene then cuts to them at Tapa village, and Rana mentions that she wants to thank Makoto properly, and she asks him to wait here for a while, and she goes to inform the villagers about this. Makoto wonders if Ido is not going to go after her, and Ido is surprised that Makoto can speak werewolf, and he mentions that it wouldn't be right for a demi-human to enter a human village. He states that his village is in the woods ahead, but Rana and some villagers are close to him. Makoto then checks the village with his investigative Kai, and he notices that the bandits have killed some people again. He then mentions that he knew that Ito was awake when he was carrying him, and he wonders if he pretended to be unconscious because he felt like he was the one who put Rana in danger. Ito states that he is right, and Makoto asks him to keep her safe the next time, if he wants to be with her. Makoto then uses his investigative Kai to find out that the bandits are in the mountains right now, and he goes after them. Ito warns him against this, but Makoto doesn't listen, and Ito asks him why he is doing all this. Makoto mentions that the moon over the ruined castle is the name of a song in his country, and he loves it dearly. He doesn't like a bunch of bandits naming themselves that, and he wonders if this is reason enough, and he leaves. The scene then cuts to some other demiplane residents testing Mio's cooking this time, but the results are the same. Mio thinks that she even used premium ingredients this time, and she wonders how this happened. Tomoe notices that the dishes Mio made look nothing like what they are supposed to, and she mentions that great ingredients don't necessarily guarantee great taste. She states that different races also have different palates and preferences, and all of the different species in the demiplane then tells Mio what kind of food they like, and Mio thinks that she never knew that cooking would require such profound knowledge. Tomoe states that they should ask Lime if they want to match the preferences of the young master, but it would be stressful for him to do this alone. She then tells Mio to travel around the world to improve her cooking skills, and Mio thinks that this is a great idea. She mentions that she is going to embark on a culinary journey for the sake of the young master, and everyone is happy to hear this. Tomoe then thinks that she should also start her investigation, as she doesn't want the young master to be caught up in any trouble. The scene then cuts to the bandits in the forest, and they are planning their next move. We see that Makoto is put on his mask again to fight them, as he doesn't want to expose his identity, and he uses Silence Kai to silent all sounds in the area. The bandit leader is surprised to see that he can't make any sounds, and Makoto then shoots the bandits one after the other. While shooting he thinks that he vowed to never get involved in human affairs, but here he is eliminating bandits for humans. He thinks that he also made his mind to act on his emotions when he hesitated, and he goes to the bandits after thinning down their numbers. He thinks that he has only knocked the bandits out, and he has missed their vital organs. He then puts away his bow, and he uses fire magic to defeat the rest of the bandits. This causes an explosion, and the villagers notice this. Makoto then tells the bandit leader that he is not going to kill them, and he asks him to not call their group the moon over the ruined castle. The scene then cuts to the villagers finding the bandits tied to a tree, and Rana asks Ito if this was done by Makoto, and Ito mentions that it was. She then thanks the goddess for this, and afterwards we see Makoto with Shiki, and Shiki asks him where he was all day. Makoto states that he was taking care of some business, and he asks Shiki if he has found an inn. Shiki mentions that he has, and it costs three gold coins a night. 
Shiki then tells Makoto that the heroes he mentioned earlier have received a hospitable welcome in Linnea Kingdom and Britonia Empire. He states that Makoto is the only one forced to live a frugal life, and he thinks that he can't accept this. Makoto then explains that he saw other heroes when he was teleported to the battlefield, and he wonders if he is ever going to meet them again. The story then goes back in time to the days before Makoto was summoned to another world. Makoto is walking around the school like usual, and a girl named Hibiki Otanashi approaches him. She mentions that the date on the document that he just received from the student council is wrong, and she exchanges his documents with the correct ones. Makoto thanks her, and he leaves. Habiki then thinks that Makoto Masumi is said to be the hero who went and joined the student council, where all other members are handsome guys, and he is just an average Joe. Habiki thinks that he doesn't look like a hero, but she does envy him a little. She thinks that with some effort, she can get anything that she wants, and she keeps trying new things, but she never encounters any setbacks, and everything goes smoothly for her. She thinks that she really has an easy life, but it's utterly boring. Habiki then unexpectedly gets summoned to another world, and she wonders where she is, and the goddess tells her that she is in another world. She mentions that the world under her protection is being attacked by demons, and it's in a crisis unlike anything before. She hopes that Habiki can lend her strength to her, and she mentions that her plan is to send Habiki and another person to her world as heroes. She mentions that she will do her best to bless Habiki with some power, but Habiki refuses the goddess's offer, and she asks her to get someone else for this job. She mentions that she has plenty of friends, and her life has been really smooth until now. The goddess then asks her if she wants to spend the rest of her life with friends, whom she shares no connection with. Hibiki asks the goddess what's her point, and the goddess mentions that the world that Hibiki is in right now is too small. She states that Hibiki must have longed for a friend who will always have her back, and a life worth taking risks for. This piques Hibiki's interest, and the goddess states that she will bless Hibiki with powerful magic, and increase her physical strength. She will have charismatic leadership, and she will also have a divine item. The goddess gives Hibiki, a silver belt, and she sends Hibiki to Limia Kingdom after telling her that she has high hopes for her. Meanwhile at Limia Kingdom, the king receives a prophecy from the goddess about the descendants of a hero, and he thinks that Limia can finally be free from the torment of the demons. Habiki then gets teleported to the kingdom, and she notices that many people have gathered to welcome her. The goddess tells everyone that she is the hero, and she asks them to treat her well. Habiki wonders if this is all the goddess has to say, and she finds it hard to believe that this is another world. While all this is happening, Makoto was still wandering around the wastelands, and no one was there to welcome him. Days after Habiki is summoned, she notices the map of the continent which looks like Japan. She mentions that the demons have been forced to live on a barren land by the goddess's people, but they have expanded their territory for a decade. This led to the fall of the kingdom of Elcyon, and then the Limia kingdom allied with Gratonia Empire to draw a last line of defense. Habiki then remembers that the officials didn't like it when she told them that there is another hero, and it's in the Gratonia Empire. She thinks that it's only natural for neighboring countries to be unfriendly, and she thinks that she should get ready for the worst, after the war with the demons ends. She then mentions that the belt that the goddess gave her, had a wolf spirit in it, and she thinks that she never expected this. Habiki then thinks that tomorrow she has to choose her party members from a group of mercenaries, and she notices that based on the king's recommendations the confirmed members are the court magician Woody, and a rising star among the knights called Norst. Habiki thinks that she can smell nepotism in this, and the scene cuts to her choosing her party members the next day. A girl named Naval notices Habiki during the recruitment, and she thinks that she doesn't smell blood on her. She thinks that Habiki doesn't belong on the battlefield, and she tries to leave, but the court magician Woody stops her. He asks her if she is leaving already, and Naval mentions that she is not interested in becoming some elite student's bodyguard, as she just wants to kill demons. She tries to leave again, but Habiki stops her, and she mentions that Naval seems like the strongest fighter here. She states that she wants her to join her party, and train her in swordplay, and she mentions that she would also like for her to be her partner in battle who will watch her back. Nabel mentions that she can entrust her life to someone who needs sword training from her, and Habiki whispers to her that she knows that Nabel just wants to slay some demons, and if she follows her then she will be able to kill as many of them as she wants in the front lines. She can guarantee that Nabel won't get bored, 
and she states that this is much better than rejecting her offer and not being able to stay in this country. Nabal accepts Hibiki's offer, and a knight named Norse thinks that Hibiki is really beautiful, and he needs to find a way to stay with her. While all this is going on Makoto was fighting a dragon, and the dragon fell in love with him. Afterwards the scene cuts to Linnea Kingdom's border, and Hibiki and her party are there to pick a priestess from the Laurel Commonwealth. They then notice that the priestess's carriage is in trouble, and she is surrounded by kobolds. Norst mentions that these are monsters that become stronger by devouring mana, but they are very strong. Rudy states that the priestess from Laurel is amazing for being able to hold off so many enemies with her shield, and Nabel notices that there are four kobolds. She mentions that they will all have to take one out, and unless they finish them quickly, they might summon reinforcements with a scream. Nabel asks Habiki if she is going to be fine as she has never slayed a monster, and Habiki mentions that she will be all right. All of them then attack the kobolds, and they manage to take one of them out, but Habiki fails to deliver a fatal blow, and the kobold asks her to save him. This makes Habiki hesitate to kill it, and the kobold screams to summon reinforcements. A bunch of kobolds then come running, and Nabal and the others fight them, and Nabal asks Habiki to stand down. The kobolds overwhelm their party, and they almost manage to break the priestess's barrier. Habiki thinks that this is all her fault, and she then slays the kobolds in rage. She states that as the hero she has to keep moving forward, and the others follow her lead to defeat all of the kobolds. Afterwards Hibiki cries because of the carnage she has caused, and Naval mentions that she did great for her first time. The priestess then thanks the hero for saving her, and she introduces herself as Chia. She asks to join the hero's party, and everyone is surprised to hear this. They try to stop her, but Chia cuts her hair and she mentions that if her people see her hair then they might think that the people of Limia have done something bad to her, and Habiki's party members can't believe that she is threatening them. Shia mentions that she just wants to end this war, and Habiki tells her that her threat is too contradicting. She mentions that Shia shouldn't have cut her beautiful hair, and Shia mentions that her hair would only get in the way during battle. Habiki and Naval mention that they should also cut their hair in this case, and Shia tells them that they don't need to as they are already really strong. Hibiki tells her that this is also true for Chia, as her magic shield was amazing, and she asks Chia to teach her how to use magic. Chia agrees, and Hibiki mentions that they secured many victories in their war with the demons after that, and they never lost a battle until they ran into the Black Spider of Calamity. They try to fight the Black Spider of Calamity, but they stand no chance against it, and the spider regenerates almost instantly after they injure it. The spider then defeats all of Hibiki's party members one after the other, and seeing her party members get injured Hibiki tries to fight the spider in rage. She manages to injure the spider's eyes, and the spider also badly injures her. She wonders if she is going to die here, and she faints. She opens her eyes on a bed in the castle, and she notices that every one of her party members have also survived. She is surprised that they lost even after they fought with everything they had, and she thinks that defeat is unbearable. She thanks the Black Spider of Calamity for this defeat, and she mentions that she is going to defeat it the next time. The story then goes back in time to a few days after Habiki was summoned, and we see some guys bullying a boy named Tomoki Iwahasi. We find out that Tomoki is a model, and the guys are trying to get some money from him, but Habiki refuses them. The guys try to beat him up, but Habiki is saved by some girls, and he flees the scene as he gets embarrassed being saved by girls. The scene then cuts to him playing video games in his house, but he is still irritated about earlier, and he tosses his video game aside. He lies down, and he notices an isekai novel beside him, and he thinks that if he has a cheat power in another world, then even he can be brave. The goddess then summons him to another world, and she introduces herself. She tells him that the world under her protection is crawling with monsters, and she wants him to save her world by becoming a hero. She mentions that he doesn't need to worry as she has sent another person to this world, and he will also be blessed with her power. Tomoki asks her what kind of power he is going to get, and the goddess tells him that he will get a body capable of combating monsters, and magical power that pales in comparison to demons. He will also get the devil eye which makes people submit to his will and a pair of silver boots which gives him the ability to fly, while dispelling fatigue from his body. Tomoki thinks that these are all cheat skills, but he thinks of all this as a dream, and he asks the goddess if this is all he is going to get. 
The goddess mentions that she can also grant him a body that cannot die at night, but this power can only be used when the moon is out. Tomoki asks the goddess if she can change his look into something he wants, and the goddess states that she can. The goddess then changes his look, and she sends him to the Gritonia Empire. Tomoki is welcomed by the princess named Lily Flaunt Gritonia in the Empire, and she tells him that she is the second princess of Gritonia. Tomoki also introduces himself, and Lily asks him to come with her as this is not a good place to talk. On the way a female knight named Genebia asks the princess if the prophecy was true, and the princess introduces Tomoki to her. Tomoki takes a close look at her saying that he has never seen a female knight, and Genebia tells him that this is rude. Tomoki unwillingly uses his devil eye on her, and this makes Genebia attracted to him, and she doesn't mind him being rude. Lily notices this, and she takes Tomoki to test his level and his compatibility with magical items. After the tests Tomoki is tired, and Lily tells him that she will send someone to him at night to show him around the castle. She asks him to rest for the time being, and the princess then asks a doctor about the results of Tomoki's test. The doctor tells her that Tomoki has some kind of magical eye that bolsters the effect of charming, and Lily asks the doctor to help her in negating the effects of Tomoki's eye on her, and the rest of the royal family. She asks him to not tell of this power to anybody else, and she thinks that she doesn't like the innocent look that the hero has. Afterwards Lily introduces Tomoki to their alchemist named Yukinatsu, and she mentions that Yukinatsu wants to talk with Tomoki. Yukinatsu is energetic, and she tells Tomoki that she is an alchemist, but she doesn't mix potions, she makes golems. Tomoki gets excited to hear this, and he accidentally uses his devil eye on her as well. Yukinatsu then mentions that she heard that Tomoki can use every magic item that there is, and she states that she would like to have a discussion with him in her room. Lily interrupts them, and she mentions that the two of them can talk another day. The scene then cuts to Tomoki wandering around the castle, and he notices a dragon. He notices a girl around the dragon, and he finds out that she is a dragon summoner named Mora. The two of them then talk, and Tomoki asks Mora if she lives in the castle with her family. Mora tells him that she doesn't, and she mentions that her family was attacked by demons, and they only came here because Princess Lily took them in. Tomoki then accidentally uses his devil eye on Mora as well, and she gets charmed by him, and she asks him to marry her. She mentions that she wants him to be her family, and the scene cuts to Tomoki telling Lily that he has formed a party with three people. He tells her that it's Genebia, Yukinatsu, and Mora, and Lily thinks that Tomoki still doesn't seem to have any control over his devil eye. Tomoki then asks Lily what she thought about him when she first saw him, and Lily states that she knew that he was the hero that would lead them to greatness. She mentions that Tomoki is a great hero, and everyone admires him, and she kisses him. The two of them then spend the night together, and afterwards Lily thinks that she is willing to sacrifice anything as long as they get to wipe out the demons. She thinks that this is all for the sake of her mother who believed in that wayward goddess, and while all this is going on Makoto enters into a contract with the Black Spider. The scene then cuts to Tomoki returning to the palace after a battle, and Lily greets him. She mentions that Tomoki did great in their last battle like usual, and next they will try to reclaim Fort Stellar from the demons. She tells him that they will be allying with Linnea in their next battle, and Tomoki states that he will finally get to meet the other hero. Lily wonders if Tomoki is interested in the Linnean hero, and she mentions that she has heard that the hero of Linnea is gorgeous. Tomoki states that Lily doesn't need to worry as he only needs her, and his friends here, and Lily gives a manipulative smile hearing this. The scene then cuts to Hibiki and her party in the army camp near Fort Stellar, and Hibiki finds out that there is going to be a ball. She thinks that they will likely confirm the strategy to reclaim Fort Stellar there, and Mabel tells her that she should think of it as a party to raise the army's morale. She mentions that she has heard that the hero of Gritonia is praying for the goddess's blessing, and she states that if their enemies are demi-humans or demons, the goddess would bestow them her blessing unconditionally, and this gives humans the advantage. Hibiki then makes a concerned face, and Naval asks her if she is nervous about meeting Gritonia's hero. Hibiki mentions that this is one of the reasons, and she states that she has heard that the other hero is around her age, and he is also from her world. Afterwards Hibiki and her party meet Princess Lily and Tomoki, and Lily explains the battle plan to them. She mentions that the King of Ion has provided both supplies and reinforcements, but the amount from Laurel is less than expected, and Hibiki's party should know why. 
Hibiki thinks that they must be mad because of the matter with Chia, and Lily mentions that there is no need to worry as their combat strength is five times that of the demons, and with the goddess's blessing, victory should be theirs. She asks them if there are any other questions, and Hibiki wonders why the battle is taking place at night. Tomoki tells her that it's because they are good with night battles, and Hibiki hesitantly states that this is good, as they have no experience with it. Tomoki wonders if Linia has any plans or suggestions, and Hibiki states that they don't. Tomoki mentions that it should be fine as this is only a minor boss, and the goddess's blessing is going to buff their strength, and debuff their enemies. He mentions that they must reclaim the fort with haste, and earn the goddess's praise, and he states that they should relax and chat now. Hibiki then asks Tomoki if they have ever met in the real world, and Tomoki states that they haven't. Hibiki then remembers that Tomoki has the same name as the model that her friends liked, and Tomoki annoyingly tells her that this has nothing to do with him. Hibiki apologizes for mistaking him for somebody else, and upsetting him, and Tomoki mentions that he is not upset. He then asks Hibiki her level, and she states that it's 430. Tomoki mentions that his level is 603, and Hibiki wonders why he is suddenly showing off his level. Hibiki states that Tomoki must have worked hard, and Tomoki mentions that this is why she should stop calling him by his first name, and call him Mr. Tomoki instead. Hibiki mentions that she will be mindful in the future, while thinking that he is the one who told them to relax and chat, and Tomoki states that he will be using her first name as he is not good with honorifics. Hibiki agrees, and she wonders what's wrong with this guy. The scene then cuts to Hibiki staring at the sky, and Naval asks her what's keeping her awake. Hibiki mentions that she is worried that this might be too much for them to handle, and Naval asks Hibiki why she came to this world. Hibiki mentions that in her last world, she was born in a good family, and she could achieve anything with the slightest effort. Naval states that she did get that kind of feeling from her, and she mentions that she never expected Hibiki to go into battle. She mentions that Hibiki cried like a baby because she couldn't kill the kobold, and Hibiki states that this was the first time she tasted defeat in her life, and the first time she could entrust her life to someone else. She mentions that there will be worse hardships and surprises ahead of them, but she doesn't regret coming to this world. She then states that they should turn in for today, as they do have a battle to fight tomorrow, and the scene then cuts to Tomoki, and the soldiers praying for the blessing of the goddess the next night. Afterwards we see the commander of the demon army named Rona receiving information about the marching paths of Linian and Gritonian troops. She finds out that they have just received the goddess's blessing and are moving forward. Rona mentions that everything is just as she has anticipated so far, and she states that she is going into the fray, and she asks the soldier to inform Eo about this. The scene then cuts to the human army marching ahead, and Woody asks his party mates to watch for enemy traps as this terrain is perilous. He mentions that they have lost too many knights and mages on this route, and they are then attacked by the demon army. Tomoki orders his troops to engage, and they all fight the demon soldiers. They manage to defeat most of them easily, and Hibiki thinks that their enemies seem a little too weak. She mentions that she was told that it was impossible to even reach the fort using this path, and she asks Chia to deploy a barrier and Woody to cast a levitating spell for high-speed movements as a precaution. The human army then manages to reach the gates of the fort, and they open it. Rona then notices that the two heroes are in range, and she states that it's time to put their strengths to test. She uses a magic array to make the entire human army fall into a giant pitfall, but Hibiki's party manages to survive due to Woody's levitation spell that he casted earlier. Tomoki also manages to survive due to his flying boots, and Rona tries to attack him with magic, but he manages to counter her attack using his divine lance attack. Tomoki then wonders if his party members are alright, and he notices that they are fine due to the replica of his boots that Yukinatsu created. He is glad to see this, and he asks Mora to summon the dragon named Nagi. The dragon then comes there, and Tomoki attacks the fort while riding it. Rona thinks that the dragon's firepower is as formidable as she has heard, but they will need to do more to capture this fort. Tomoki then lands inside the fort, and he asks Mora and Yukinatsu to provide support while he charges ahead with Janibia. They then come across Eo, and Tomoki attacks him. Eo mentions that it's rude to attack without introducing themselves first, but Tomoki states that manners don't mean anything in battle, and he attacks Eo again. He manages to take out one of his arms, and Hibiki then attacks Eo as well, but he manages to block. 
She then introduces herself, and Yeo introduces himself as the general of the Demon Lord's Third Legion. He instantly regenerates his arm, and the heroes are surprised to see this. Yeo then uses a ring to nullify the goddess's blessing on the heroes, and this weakens both of the heroes. They can't believe that the goddess's blessing has been negated, and Tomoki thinks that this means that he can die if he receives damage right now. He then states that they should fall back, and Hibiki wonders if he is going to leave her to fight alone. Tomoki tells her that she should also fall back, and he states that they are heroes, and they can't afford to fall here. He mentions that they can always regroup and retaliate, and Hibiki agrees with his reasoning, but she can't let all those sacrifices be for nothing. She stays behind, and Eo mentions that it's a shame that she must fight alone. Hibiki states that she is not alone, and the rest of her party then comes there. They mention that they have sent off the retreating survivors, and they have also taken care of the minor grunts. Eo then asks her to prove her worth as a hero, and the goddess notices that her humans are at a disadvantage. The heroes she sent are in an unfavorable situation, and she finds Makoto. Meanwhile the night turns to day while Hibiki and the others fight Eo, and we see that they are all exhausted while Eo is still fine. Hibiki still fights Eo, but Eo manages to hit her back, and she thinks that it's futile. They lack the strength to defeat this monster, and Rona then asks Sophia how things are on her side. Sophia mentions that she is prepared, and Mitsuruji notices the goddess's light near them. The others also notice this, and this gives Hibiki some hope. She asks everyone to hang in there, as the goddess hasn't abandoned them, and meanwhile Makoto faces off against Sophia in battle. Hibiki and the others also continue to fight and we see that now they can barely stand even with the help of their support spell. Naval then asks Woody to use that support item, and she mentions that they can't lose the hero here. She mentions that they also can't lose Chia and the rest of them, and Woody hesitates to use that item, but Naval manages to convince him. Naval then retreats for a bit, and she asks the others to cover for her, and Woody tells Chia to cast a powerful support spell on Naval, and he empowers her sword with a talisman. He also gives her the rose sign, and after using it a rose tattoo appears on her neck. Naval then fights Eo, and she manages to shatter his armor and injure him in an instant. Hibiki wonders what kind of spell Naval just used, and Naval mentions that she just used a special medium. She asks Hibiki to cover for her, and Norse notices the rose tattoo on her. Naval then manages to cut one of Eo's arms, and she doesn't give him enough time to heal. Eo is surprised that there is a spell like this in the human world, and Naval mentions that she is also surprised that Eo can fight her in this form. Eo mentions that he is the strongest demon general in terms of combat strength, and Naval then tries to go for his head while the others support her. She manages to injure him, but Eo unleashes his second form, and this heals him. Naval then gives Woody the signal to retreat, and Woody uses his high-speed movements to get everyone, but her out of there. Hibiki tells him to get Naval as well, but seeing the look on Naval's face, she realizes what's going on. She still tries to go to her, but Norse stops her and he tells her that Nabel has already activated the rose sign. She has acquired power beyond her limits, but the cost is her life force. We then see that the rose sign has started to take its toll on Nabel, and Eo states that Nabel is not in a state to fight. Nabel mentions that she still hasn't shown her full power, and she mentions that she used to be a woman who only killed in battles, but she found comrades who treated her like family, and friends to whom she could entrust her life. She mentions that if it's her fate to die a brutal death, then she at least wants to choose the time and place, and she mentions that she is going to die a meaningful death. She then attacks Eo, and she detonates herself in an attempt to take Eo out with her. She thinks that she had a great time with Hibiki and she perishes. Hibiki cries seeing the explosion from her direction, and the scene cuts to Tomoki wondering if he should have stayed with Hibiki. Lily tells him that he made the right call, as it's necessary for the hero to survive, and Tomoki thinks that Lily has a point and he hugs her. He mentions that he is going to become stronger, so he can fight even without the hero's blessing. Lily tells him that she will always stay by his side, and we see that Naval's attack did manage to injure Eo, but he survived. Rona then tells him that Sophia has been defeated, and she mentions that it was probably by the person who came enveloped in the golden light. We then see Mio and Tomoe healing Makoto after his fight with Sophia, and Tomoe asks Mio to ease up on her healing or she is going to lose her arm. 
Mio mentions that she doesn't care, and we are told that at this time Makoto knew nothing about the hero who ended this war, or how his followers saved him, and back in the present we see that Makoto has finally reached the academy. The scene then cuts to Mio and Tomoe leaving on journeys of their own, and Mio wishes that she could talk to Makoto. Tomoe wonders if she wanted to surprise him with the results of her culinary discovery, and she asks Mio where she is heading. Mio states that she is going to a port town called Karan, and she wants to find seaweed and kelp there, as they are commonly used in the Japanese-style cooking that their young master likes. Mio wonders if Tomoe is going to investigate the place where the young master fought the dragon slayer, and Tomoe states that she is, as a giant lake appeared after the fight, and she wants to know why. Mio thinks that they are really lonely right now, and Tomoe mentions that this won't be the case for too long. She states that she received word from Shiki that the young master has reached the town of Rostgard, and he should return to the demiplane once he has settled down. Afterwards we see Makoto and Shiki in the town of Rostgard, and Makoto notices that there are a variety of stores and products here. They then notice that a girl is being bullied by some guys, and Makoto thinks that someone in this situation would have an expression like this, but the look in this girl's eyes indicates that she has given up, and she doesn't care about anything. Makoto gets concerned seeing this, and he tries to tell the boys to stop, but due to his inability to communicate with humans, they don't even notice him. Makoto then tells Shiki to stop them, and Shiki asks them what they think they are doing. The guys ask them if they can't see the uniform they are wearing, and Makoto thinks that this is the uniform of Rostgard Academy. He thinks that if Tomoe and Mio were here they would totally suggest killing these guys, but Shiki would never do this. Shiki then asks Makoto if he can kill them, as they called him a fool, and they insulted his master as well. Makoto tells him that they can't simply kill people, and Shiki wonders if Makoto wants to torture them first. Makoto tells him that he wants him to convince them to leave, and Shiki asks the guys to leave before he kills them. Hearing this the guys take out their wands, and they use wind magic to start levitating. Makoto asks them if they are not going to attack, and the guys are surprised to hear this, probably because this is the only type of magic they know. Shiki then uses his earth magic to lift them up, and Makoto uses his magic counter spell to dispel the earth magic. He thinks that the guys should be fine as they are levitating, and Makoto then tells the girl to leave if she is not injured, and the girl mentions that she didn't ask to be saved. Makoto states that she can just forget about this, and he mentions that she doesn't have to feel like she owes him any favors. The girl then tells Makoto that she waits tables at the Five Irons restaurant, and she will repay his kindness if he goes there, as they serve great hot pots. Makoto tells Shiki that they should check it out later, and he then notices that the guys are still levitating in the air. Shiki mentions that they should leave them like this, and they will fall when they run out of mana. Makoto tells Shiki to save them, and Shiki uses his wind magic to do so, but he makes them fall. Makoto thinks that Shiki should grow up, and the guys then run away after telling Makoto and Shiki that they are going to make them pay. Shiki then tells Makoto that it's impossible to stop this kind of thing from happening, and they should not get involved in this. Makoto mentions that he knows this, but the look in that girl's eye was concerning. Shiki apologizes for speaking out of turn, and Makoto states that for now they should find an inn. He mentions that the entrance exam is three days from now, and Shiki asks him if he will be taking the exam. Makoto states that in order for him to be recognized as a local resident, and get a permit to set up a store, he will have to make it to the academy. Shiki then tells Makoto that he is not actually taking the entrance exam, but the lecturer qualification exam. Makoto wonders what that is, and Shiki tells him that it's an exam to become a teacher. The documents he got from Rembrandt clearly states that it's the lecturer qualification exam, and the scene cuts to Rembrandt thinking that Makoto must have made it to Rostgard by now. He then notices that Morris is having trouble reading some small writings, and he wonders if he is suffering from presbyopia. Morris thinks that he is having no problem reading things that he is used to, and Rembrandt mentions that they should get Morris some prescription glasses, or he might make mistakes in the documents. The scene then cuts to the day of the lecturer qualification examination, and Makoto thinks that he would have run away if Rembrandt didn't make a recommendation for him. Afterwards one of the academy's staff states that he will explain the rules of the examination to Makoto, but before he begins Makoto asks him if there are any other job vacancies in this institute besides that of a teacher. The staff gets annoyed after hearing this, and he mentions that Makoto is not the first person to ask this, and he gives him an earful. 
This makes Shiki angry, and he sucks the life force out of the staff. Makoto stops Shiki before he does anything too drastic, and he apologizes on behalf of Shiki. Shiki is still angry at the staff for insulting Makoto, and a woman then comes there, and she apologizes on behalf of the staff. She states that badmouthing and complaining about examinees is strictly prohibited here, and their staff made a mistake, even if the applicant didn't choose the right time for inquiring about job openings. Shiki mentions that his master was just inquiring before his interview, and the woman then checks Makoto's documents before the exam. She notices that he excels in all combat techniques, and she asks him if he wants to give priority to the written or practical exam. She notices that he also has a letter of recommendation from Rembrandt Trading Company, and she thinks that he must be quite accomplished. She asks him what he is going to choose, and Shiki chooses the practical-only exam for Makoto. He mentions that this is the most difficult one out of all, and only a handful of people have managed to pass it, and Makoto was surprised to hear this. The scene then cuts to the examiner explaining the rules of the exam, and he mentions that this exam is going to last for three days. He states that every examinee must have received two items. One of them is a feather, and they can use it to return here from the exam venue. The other item is a bell which they can use to forfeit. He mentions that the examinees are not allowed to battle each other, but that said, they will probably be assigned to locations far away from each other, so there is little chance of them running into each other. He states that they can borrow any weapon they like, but they will have to make their own food. He asks them to be careful as monsters also inhabit the area, and he mentions that to pass the exam, they will have to collect three high-speed balls within three days, and bring them back to the academy. Makoto thinks that this sounds simple, and the examiner mentions that the details of how to capture the balls are written in the manual given to them. The scene then cuts to Makoto at the exam venue, and he uses Perception Kai to notice that this area has plenty of food and water, and compared to the wilderness he was first summoned to, this is a paradise. He notices that the other examinees are far away from here, and he finds a red ball. He reads the manual and he finds out that the balls will stop moving after taking enough damage, but they have to be attacked by the designated methods. If not then they will crack, and he reads that the red balls can only receive physical damage. He then punches the ball, but it breaks. Makoto is surprised to see this, and he wonders if he got the color wrong. He then notices a yellow ball which can only receive damage by magic. He uses a brid to attack it, but the yellow ball breaks as well. He then notices a blue ball, which can only receive damage from ranged attacks, and he uses a bow to damage it, but the blue ball breaks as well. Afterwards he wonders if the damage exceeded its limits, and he thinks that he should disable the boosting spell that he always casts on himself. Even after undoing the spell the balls break as soon as he touches them, and the first day ends without him making any progress at all. He then erects a barrier that causes pain when touched, and he goes to sleep. The next morning, he notices a bunch of defeated monsters outside the barrier, and after dealing with them he checks up on what the other examinees are doing. He notices that the elf is not here anymore, and he wonders if they have already finished. Makoto then tries to get a blue ball, and he tries to hit it with just the fletching of the arrow. He succeeds to hit it like that, but the ball teleports. He locates it, and he hits it with the fletching once more, and this stops the ball from moving. Makoto is happy to finally get one of the balls, and he notices that the human is also gone now. He wonders if they passed where they dropped out, and he then locates a yellow ball. To capture it he weakens himself with his kai, and he fires the weakest brid he can. This stops the yellow ball from moving, and he thinks that at this rate he can make it, as he still has one day left. He then eats some food, and he notices that someone new has appeared in the area this time. He wonders if examinees can enter partway through the test, and he thinks that it's fine as long as they don't bother him. The next morning Makoto notices a suspicious-looking guy among the monsters who have fallen victim to his barrier, and the assassin attacks him with some knives. Makoto blocks, and the assassin uses a spell to hide his presence. Makoto can still sense him because of his kai, and he tries to gain some distance, but the assassin stops him by grabbing his clothes, and he tries to attack him with a knife. Makoto breaks the knife using his bare hands, and the assassin backs off. Makoto then notices that the knife had poison in it, and he asks the assassin if he is targeting the examinees. The assassin states that he is, and he mentions that the others have already left. 
He states that he wasn't too enthusiastic about this job, but Makoto was going to pay for breaking his knife. He mentions that Makoto was going to die in a few seconds, as his knife was coated with a fast-acting poison, but he notices that nothing is happening to Makoto. He wonders if Makoto has neutralized the poison, and Makoto mentions that he can tell him how he did this, if he tells him about the person who hired him. The assassin mentions that he doesn't know the client, as he accepted the job from the assassin's guild, and Makoto thinks that he shouldn't pry further. The assassin then notices that he can't move, and Makoto tells him that he has temporarily paralyzed him from the neck down. He then informs the assassin that he is immune to poisons, and he kicks him away. Afterwards we see that the day is almost over and Makoto hasn't been able to catch a single red ball. He thinks that he can't use pure physical strength because his body constantly emits mana, and even the bow he got from the academy is a magical item. He then remembers that the knife that he got for cooking is not a magic item, and he manages to capture a red ball using it. He then returns to the exam hall, and he notices that the others are already here. He shows the balls to the examiner, and the examiner can't believe that he gathered three balls of different colors. He mentions that normally people gather three balls of the color susceptible to their best attack, but he brought back one of each. He mentions that no one has ever passed this exam like this, and the scene then cuts to Makoto at the end. He tells Shiki that he has been hired as a temporary instructor, but he still has some time until the next step in the process, so they should go and check out that hot pot restaurant. Shiki mentions that he will look forward to it, and we then see the examiner from before whining in a bar. He mentions that no one was supposed to pass the test this time, and a girl asks him what he means. The examiner mentions that someone said that they have enough practical skill teachers, so they wanted to increase the difficulty of the exam, but he still managed to gather three balls of different colors, and the girl thinks that this is interesting. The scene then cuts to Makoto securing a permit to open a local store in Rostgard, and we find out that he recently received a notice informing him about his official employment as a lecturer. Shiki mentions that the notice came really suddenly, and Makoto states that the registration time is this afternoon. He mentions that they can head there after lunch, and they go to the Five Irons. Luria welcomes them, and she thanks them for their frequent patronage. She wonders if they are having hot pots today as well, and Shiki states that they are. Makoto asks her to prepare a chicken hot pot for him, and Luria thinks that the two of them are a rare bunch, as people usually share one hot pot. Makoto then explains that they have been coming here for five days now, and Shiki is addicted to this particular delicacy. We see that one of the students from earlier named Ilungand is watching Makoto, and he wonders why the two of them keep visiting Luria. A female student from the academy then approaches Ilungand, and she mentions that she has some things to discuss with him. The scene then cuts to Luria serving Makoto's group their hot pots, and Makoto mentions that Shiki is addicted to the creamy hot pot which he doesn't like at all. Luria then asks Makoto if he is going to teach at the academy, and she tries to tell him that she knows someone there, but another waitress summons her for some work, and she leaves. The scene then cuts to Makoto at the academy, and one of the staff informs him that Makoto has to follow certain rules if he wants to work here. She mentions that his business won't be a problem as long as it doesn't involve monetary transactions in school, and she states that the wages of a teacher is determined by the number of students they teach, and they get 10 silver coins for each student they teach. She mentions that as a part-time teacher Makoto can have a maximum of 30 students, and she asks him to start his first lesson next week. Makoto understands, and he states that he would like to start a class with 10 students. The staff member is surprised to hear this, as most teachers try to take in as many students as they can, and Makoto mentions that he would like to focus on the quality of teaching. A full-time lecturer named Blight then comes there, and he talks to Makoto. He finds out that Makoto wants to focus on teaching practical skills, and Blight mentions that he will send 10 students who are interested in the subject to Makoto's class. Makoto thanks him, and Blight mentions that the students this year are excellent, and some of them can even use levitation spells and telepathy. Makoto then remembers the students from earlier, and he wonders if they are considered excellent. Blight mentions that he heard how powerful Makoto is, and he states that he will look forward to seeing him in action. The scene then cuts to Makoto in the library, and the librarian wonders if she can help him. Makoto mentions that his assistant is applying for a faculty usage permit, so he came here to search for some materials for his class. The librarian asks him what books he is looking for, 
and Makoto asks her if she has any books on magic spells. The librarian mentions that this kind of stuff would be below Makoto's level, and Makoto puts up a barrier and he wonders how she knows his name. The librarian states that it's her duty to know his name, and Makoto mentions that he can't believe this, as there are over a hundred lecturers in this academy. The librarian then mentions that she heard about him when she was dining with the examiner, and she states that Luria of the Five Irons is also her younger sister. She told him about a pair of customers who always ordered two sets of hot pots, and Makoto thinks that this must be the person Luria wanted to tell him about. The librarian then introduces herself as Eva, and Makoto thinks that he feels like there is something sinister behind her smile, and she reminds him of Mio. The scene then cuts to Mio at the port town of Karan, and we see that she is learning how to cut vegetables from a girl named Beretta. Beretta teaches her the basics, and she shows her how to peel a radish. Mio is surprised to see how adept she is at doing this, and Beretta mentions that this technique is called Katsuramuki, and Mio thinks that this technique might be applied in areas beyond cooking. A week then passes by, and we see some students heading to attend Makoto's class. They wonder how their teacher is going to be, and they are a little concerned. They think that they are the students of Professor Blight, and simply attending the class would be enough for them. We see that Makoto is using his investigative kai to listen to all this, and he thinks that they are totally looking down on him. Shiki states that Makoto should let him be the mean face in the class, and Makoto mentions that the students would just look down on him if he is too kind. He states that he will do his best to be the mean teacher, and the students then arrive there. Shiki and Makoto introduce themselves to them, and the students think that Makoto looks like a kobold. Makoto tells them that he will provide them a thorough lesson with focus on magic, and he asks one of the students what elements he can command. The student states that he has an affinity with wind, and Makoto asks him about his other element. The student mentions that he knows some earth and fire magic, and he asks the same question to another student. She states that she can use fire and wind magic, and Makoto asks them how many of them can command multiple elements with the same level of mastery. The students fall silent, and Makoto thinks that he will do what Tomoe did. He mentions that he now has a good understanding of their strengths, and he states that they will remain a bunch of third rates unless they improve. One of the girls mentions that he is going too far, and she states that they were accepted in this academy because they are qualified. Makoto mentions that he is only stating the facts, and another student states that when it comes to magic, it's natural to choose an element and master it. Makoto mentions that they will be torn apart on the battlefield if the enemy sees through their only element, and he states that they must at least master three different elements. The students mention that this sounds simple, but they wonder if Makoto can do this himself. Makoto states that he will conduct a mock battle with Shiki to show them what they are capable of, and the two of them take positions to fight. The students notice that they can't feel any magic energy coming from Makoto, but they can feel immense power from Shiki's staff. Shiki then attacks Makoto using his staff with high speed, but Makoto manages to block everything using his barrier. Makoto talks to Shiki telepathically and he mentions that he has come a long way. Shiki states that it's because Mio and Tomoe have been training him, and Makoto then attacks him with a fire spell. Shiki manages to block with a barrier, and he then uses an earth spell to attack Makoto, but Makoto dodges, and he destroys the spell with a fire arrow. The students are surprised to see all this, and Makoto uses fire and water at the same time to attack Shiki, but Shiki manages to parry the attack. He states that it's all thanks to the staff that the elder dwarves made for him, and Makoto tells him that they can't let this battle go on forever. He mentions that they should finish it with their next move, and they both begin chanting spells. The students think that this is the first time the two of them are chanting, and they wonder how much stronger their spells are going to be now. They notice that Makoto can actually speak, and the spells of Makoto and Shiki then clash. After the dust settles down, we see that Shiki has lost, and Makoto notices that everyone is dumbfounded after their display of power. He thinks that everyone might quit this class, and he states that this will be all for today, and he asks them to decide if they want to continue attending his class. He then leaves after telepathically telling Shiki to heal the girl who was injured because of some debris, and Shiki thinks that he couldn't even land a hit on Makoto. The girls then think that they can't stay in this class, but the boys are ecstatic and scared at the same time, and they think that they might get stronger if they learn from Makoto. Shiki then heals the girl who was injured by applying some ointment, 
and the ointment works fast, and seeing this the girl thinks that it must have cost a fortune. Shiki states that there is no need to worry as they have plenty of it in their shop, and the girl is completely taken in by his good looks. Shiki then leaves, and afterwards Makoto wonders if anyone will stay for his next lesson. Shiki states that at least half of them are going to stay, and Makoto thinks that he can't change the expression on his face, and he thinks that he should avoid imitating Tomoe too much. The scene then cuts to Tomoe near the Star Lake, and she talks to a wounded soldier who witnessed the war between the demons and humans. After talking to him she finds out that the lake created during that battle is now called Star Lake, and she looks into the man's memories to find out how this lake was created. She finds out that the lake was created as a result of one of Makoto's attacks, and she thinks that the young master never ceases to amuse her. The scene then cuts to Makoto teaching his next class, and he notices that out of the ten students he got, five are still remaining. One of the students then introduce themselves as Jean Rowan, and Makoto states that he wants to be a swordsman, and he is one of the top students according to practical tests. Another student introduces himself as Izumo Kuasekabe, and Makoto mentions that he wants to be a mage, and since his name sounds Japanese, he must be from the Laurel Commonwealth. The girl introduces herself as Abelia Hopleys, and Makoto thinks that there is another Hopleys in this school, and he is the son of a great aristocrat in Limia. Another guy introduces himself as Dina Severus, and Makoto mentions that this kid is married, and his wife is on leave because she is going into labor. The last one introduces himself as Mitra Kasper, and Makoto states that he was born and raised in Rostgard, and his parents are both clerics. Izumo then asks Makoto why he talks using magic when he can speak, as he did chant a spell yesterday. Makoto states that he can't speak the common tongue due to some reason, and he starts the class. He asks everyone about the effects of mana depletion on the body, and the students mention that when half of the mana is depleted, there will be mental and physical fatigue, and when it's down to 20% the body would be unable to move. When all of the mana is depleted, the person will vomit, become confused, and pass out, and when it's depleted beyond the person's limit, then they could die. Dina states that they learned this in elementary school, and Makoto tells them that they need to know their limits through actual combat. He states that they should be ready to have injuries, and he mentions that there is no need to worry as he has plenty of medicines to replenish their mana and stamina. The scene then cuts to the students all exhausted after fighting Makoto, and we see that only Jean and Mitra are standing until the end. Mitra then uses his healing magic to strengthen Jean, and Jean tries to attack Makoto, but Makoto takes him down easily. After everyone is down, Makoto gives them some stamina and magic potions, and he states that it's meaningless to know that they have limits until they experience it firsthand. He asks them to reflect on their actions, and submit a report to him, and the scene then cuts to Ilungan winning a mock battle. He remembers that the girl from the academy gave him some pills that can boost his physical and magical powers, and she told him that this is something that the academy is currently developing. The scene then cuts to Ilungan walking down the academy's hallway with the pills, and he notices Makoto. He wonders what Makoto was doing here, and he wonders if he is a lecturer here. The scene then cuts to Makoto reviewing the reports of the students, and he thinks that they all have potential. He thinks that Jean has really good stamina, and he also checked on the movements of others, and he has what it takes to be a leader. Shiki thinks that his observations are astute, and Makoto mentions that he is not used to being a teacher but he will do his best. Elsewhere we see that Blight was the one who ordered the assassin to kill Makoto, and he can't believe that the assassin guild couldn't even assassinate a single person. The assassin mentions that Makoto was abnormally strong, and he even managed to break his knife which was made from the reversed scale of the great dragon. Blight asks him to spare the excuses, and kill that part-time lecturer as soon as possible. It's been two weeks since Makoto became a lecturer, and a new store outside of Sige has been opened. We see that Makoto has brought the ogre sisters named Aris and Aqua to work here, and he shows them the merchandise he has in this store. He tells them that this store is going to stay open until midnight, and this will help them build their reputation. The girls are terrified to hear that they have to work till that late, and Makoto states that they shouldn't worry as they are going to work in shifts and they will be able to take breaks. They will also get a food allowance, and they will have a nice manager like Shiki. He mentions that since it's a new store, it shouldn't get that busy, and this means that this store will be much easier to manage than the one in Sige. The girls think that this is great, and Makoto isn't sure if they can handle the store by themselves. 
The scene then cuts to Makoto in the academy's library, and he has an exhausted look on his face. He thinks that both his classes and business is going well, but lately girls have been asking to marry him. They are overlooking his face for his money, and they want to be his third wife, so they can be free from any duty. Makoto wonders if this can even be considered a marriage, and he looks at the drawing of his parents. Eva asks him who these people are, and Makoto mentions that they are kind people who took care of him. They were very close to him, and remembering them makes him think that the people here have a weird concept about marriage. Eva explains that many students here are children of aristocrats and merchants, and they are used to marriages of convenience. Makoto thinks that they are too young to even consider marriage, and Eva states that Makoto is really pure. Makoto then thinks that he is starting to feel like Tomoe and Mio were better than these girls as they didn't befriend him for his money. The scene then cuts to Tomoe near the Star Lake, and Lime reports to her that before the battle at Stellar Fort, someone was engaged in combat with Waterfall Laika. It was probably Sophia, and he wonders if Tomoe has found a lead about the ring that seals the power of the goddess. Tomoe mentions that she couldn't find anything regarding that, but she did find out who created the Star Lake. Lime states that this is obvious, as the young master is the only one capable of such a feat, and Tomoe then notices that Lime was tailed, and someone is outside their camp. Tomoe asks who it is, and they mention that they are just a group of travelers, and they heard that they could procure rare and fine weapons here. Tomoe allows them to enter the house, and we see that the travelers are Tomoki, Lily and Mora. Tomoe introduces herself and line to them, and she mentions that they work as guards for the Kuzunoha company at the border. Tomoki then notices that Tomoe has a fine inventory of weapons, and she also seems strong, and he asks her how old she is. Tomoe mentions that it's not nice to ask a lady her age, before introducing themselves. Tomoki's party then introduces themselves, and Lime figures out that they are the hero, and the second princess of Gritonia. Tomoe asks them what brings them here as they seem like knights and aristocrats from another kingdom, and Lily mentions that they are here to investigate the lake that appeared out of nowhere. Tomoki then asks Tomoe to let him have a look at the katana she has, and Tomoe gives it to him, but Tomoki can't draw the katana. Tomoe tells him that a spell was cast on this katana and she is the only one who can draw it. Tomoki mentions that it's impossible, as he has the power to wield any weapon in this world, and Tomoe asks him to not be so rough with it. She takes the katana back, and she shows Tomoki how it looks, as he seems interested in it. Tomoki and the others are surprised to see how good the sword is, and afterwards Tomoe states that they are busy so Tomoki's group should leave. Lily then mentions that she would like to purchase that katana, but Tomoe tells them that she is the only one who can wield it. Lily then announces to them, the real identity of their group, and she asks Tomoe to lend her strength to them for the sake of the world. Tomoe mentions that she thinks that they need the katana for a different agenda, and they might be planning to use it as a reference to develop their own weapons. She mentions that she is never going to sell her katana, and this is the end of their conversation. Tomoki then uses his magic eye on Lime, and Lime tries to convince Tomoe to allow him to give his katana to the hero. Tomoe tells him to shut up, and she mentions that her subordinate seems to be acting strange today. Tomoki then uses his magic eye on Tomoe and he asks her to join their cause of saving the world, but the magic eye has no effect on her. Tomoe tells him to stop giving her that disgusting look, and she wonders if Tomoki is a pervert, as he has been ogling her for a while. She thinks that he is a letdown for a hero, and she refuses Tomoki's offer of joining him, and she tells him that she is already devoting her heart and soul to her master. Tomoki is surprised that the magic eye didn't work on her, and Mora asks Tomoe if she is a dragon. She mentions that Tomoe is no ordinary dragon, as she has pure strength and aura, and Lily wonders if she is the waterfall Laika, as that's the strongest dragon in the area. Tomoe states that she is not Laika, and Lily can't believe that Tomoe just read her mind. Mora then tries to use her dragon summoner powers to take control of Tomoe, but it doesn't work, and Tomoe uses her aura to dispel her powers. This also dispels the effect of Tomoki's magic eye on Lime, and he wonders why he was trying to hand his katana to someone like him. This makes the hero angry, and he attacks Lime. Tomoe states that the hero is acting like a kid, and she mentions that he is just a hopeless scoundrel. She fades away into a mist, and she states that they should pretend like this meeting never happened. She mentions that if they try to brew any silly plans, 
then the hero from the empire will soon perish, and Tomoe then disappears with the mist. Tomoki then thinks that Tomoe seems like a rare character of the highest level, and he states that he wants to make her his. Elsewhere we see Tomoe and Lime, and Lime can't believe that he was about to hand over his precious katana to that pretentious brat. Tomoe then asks Lime if he wants to become her servant, and Lime agrees without any hesitation. He states that he is happy to become stronger at his own pace, but he doesn't want to regret lacking strength when it matters the most, and he starts his training with Tomoe. The scene then cuts to Mio looking for some seaweeds, and she notices that they are delicious, and they don't even seem poisonous. Hibiki's wolf then attacks her, and it pushes her into the sea, and Mio gets mad at it for drenching her kimono. She tries to end it, but Hibiki saves it, and she apologizes to Mio before she could do anything drastic. Mio notices that this human is more concerned about her well-being rather than her own life, and Hibiki mentions that she will make sure that her pet repents. She then returns her pet to Orobi, and Mio wonders if that was a spirit. Hibiki states that it was some kind of guardian beast, and seeing her weird smile reminds Mio of Makoto. Hibiki then asks Mio if she is alright, and Mio mentions that she is fine, as the wolf only left some marks on her kimono. Hibiki asks her if she can make it up to her somehow, and Mio wonders if Hibiki can help her select the best pieces of seaweeds from that pile. Mio notices that Hibiki knows how to differentiate between seaweeds and kelp, and Hibiki mentions that they can make great miso soup out of these. Mio gets excited knowing that Hibiki might know how to prepare that dish, and the scene cuts to her traveling with the hero's party two days later. Mio finds out that they are on their way to acquire weapons in Seagay, and she talks with Hibiki about cooking. Woody then thinks that Hibiki seems to be acting tough, but her emotional scars are deeper than anyone else. She has been hiding her identity in her travels, thinking that it will lift her spirits, but it won't be easy for her to heal. Mio then asks them if they are strong, and Hibiki mentions that she is a decent fighter. Mio thinks that in this case she can leave the rare creature heading their way to them, and a giant mantis-like monster then comes there. Hibiki's party tries to fight it, and Mio thinks that they are not that bad, but they are poorly equipped. Norst wonders why they had to encounter this thing before resupplying in Seagay, and he thinks that he will have to support Hibiki in Navel's place. He tries to fight the mantis head-on, but the mantis attacks and injures him, and the others ask for Hibiki's orders. Hibiki gets scared seeing her wounded party member, and it reminds her of Navel's death. She asks Mio for help, and Mio defeats the mantis by cutting it in half. This surprises the others, and she asks them if Norst is alright. They mention that his injuries aren't life-threatening, and we see that the mantis can still move, and it lands a surprise attack on Mio. This ruins her kimono, and she gets mad at the mantis, as Makoto complimented how good she looked in this kimono. She then destroys the monsters in utter rage, and Habiki's party is amazed to see her power. Mio then hopes that her kimono can be mended, and the miasma from her attack then knocks out Hibiki and her party. The wolf then comes out and it tries to protect Hibiki, and Mio thinks that the two of them must have met before, and this is why the wolf is wary of her. She tells the wolf that she has changed now, and she has no intention of harming its master, and the wolf calms down. The scene then cuts to Hibiki remembering Navel, and she wakes up in an inn. She finds a note from Mio and it tells her that Mio has brought her and her friends to Sige, and she asks them to seek out the Kuzunowa Trading Company. The scene then cuts to Hibiki at the Kuzunowa Trading Company with her party, and she meets Mio. Hibiki asks her if her kimono is going to be alright, and Mio mentions that she will have it mended. Hibiki wonders if Mio invited her to criticize her for letting her deal with that monster, but Mio tells her that she invited her over to cook. She mentions that Hibiki can repay her for saving her life by giving her a bit of her time, and Hibiki can't believe that this is all she wants. Woody then tells Mio that they came to Seagay to acquire new equipment and train in the wastelands, and they don't have much time. Mio mentions that it would be pointless for a party that struggled against that monster to head into the wastelands, and Hibiki states that regardless of this, they have to get stronger. Burin then suggests that he will make the equipment they need to fight in the wastelands, and they can pay for it later. During the three days it will take him to create the equipment, and until they are training here, he wants them to teach Mio how to cook. Mio mentions that new equipment won't guarantee their survival, and if they die, she can't learn how to cook that soup, and Habiki can't believe that Mio is more worried about her cooking than their life. 
Burin then mentions that Mio should have Toa and her party accompany them in this case, and Mio thinks that this is a great idea. Burin asks Hibiki and her party what they think, and Hibiki mentions that she appreciates the offer. The scene then cuts to Mio cooking some food, a few days later, and we see that she has gotten better at peeling the vegetables and evaluating the ingredients, but her sense of taste is horrible. Habiki then tells Mio that over the few days she has learned that Mio has a high tolerance for unsavory food, but she is also sensitive to tasty food. She states that if Mio can learn to distinguish between the two, then there is still hope for her, and she mentions that they should start by mastering this. The scene then cuts to Makoto and Shiki having some hot pot, and Shiki mentions that Tomoe has asked them to return to the demiplane as she has much to report to Makoto. Makoto thinks that they have only been communicating telepathically lately, and Shiki mentions that they should return to the demiplane, as the forest ogres will be able to handle the shop here. Makoto thinks that he is a little worried, but he mentions that he will trust Shiki, and he returns to the demiplane. Thanks for watching parts 1 to 6. The rest of the parts will be on my channel. Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and make sure to hit the subscribe button, and turn on the notification bell to keep getting new anime recap updates.